Book of Jonah, chapter number 3. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. If we had time, we'd go back to chapter number 1. The Lord spoke to Jonah, told him to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah said, Okay. And he went and chartered a boat and went the opposite direction. God sent a great storm. The, uh, the uh, sailors who were uh, skilled at sailing the rough seas and never seen a storm like that. Jonah said, I know what the problem is. It's me. Throw me overboard. They didn't want to do it, but they did. And the storm ceased. God made a great fish. A whale swallowed up Jonah. Chapter 2 is all about Jonah being in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. Can you imagine all the acid, all the whatever else that whale had eaten, and all that was in there and churning and all the fish going up and down and flipping and flopping and he's in the middle of all that? Hmm? He finally repented towards God and said, I'll go preach to him. And God had the whale vomit him up on the land. And that's where we are right here. Huh? Uh, and the Lord, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God, Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Uh, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn uh, away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Can I say this text gives the account of one of the greatest revivals recorded in Scripture. Uh, I want to look at a few things about this wonderful campaign, this wonderful revival, and glean from it because we're getting ready to go into meat. I want you to first of all notice the place. In verse number 2, God tells Jonah, Arise and go unto Nineveh. He says, That great city. In verse number 3, the last clause of the verse says, Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. They tell me that the city of Nineveh was 20 miles long, 12 miles wide, and the circumference was 60 miles. They said on a good day, a man's journey it was uh, 20 miles. So it would take three days to walk around this city. They tell me that the wall of this city was 100 feet tall, and it was broad enough for a chariot to dry, ride on. They said that it had 1,500 towers, and each tower was 200 feet high. It was a great city. We see the place that it happened. But can I say, Brother Donald, it wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't Judah. 
It wasn't Bethel. It wasn't a prominent place where God had met and done works before. Matter of fact, before uh, here uh, in Jonah, you had heard of Nineveh. And can I say, uh, after this great revival, 70 years later, a generation later, they turned their back on God again, and Nineveh was utterly destroyed, and you can't find it today. So can we say, even though it was a great city, it was an obscure place. Now I want you to not only notice the place, it's a large place, but it was a lewd place. In chapter number 1, verse number 2, it says this, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Can I say that it is a lewd place, it is a wicked place. God calls it wicked. I don't know what all was going on in, in Nineveh, but I can say this, it wasn't good. When God pronounces judgment that he's going to destroy you, it's good. Can I say this, Miss Jackie? There are sometimes we think God's not paying attention, but he's always keeping a record. And the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. And can I say that there comes a point when God says, enough is enough. And that day came for Nineveh. It was a large place, it was a lewd place, but it was a loved place. God still cared enough about it that he sent a preacher down there. Hmm? Uh, aren't you glad he's long-suffering to us? We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you glad that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Aren't you glad he has loved us with an everlasting love? even though they were wicked, God said, I'm still going to give them another chance. I'm glad he's the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. I'm glad he's long-suffering. So we see the place. But not only the place, I want you to notice the preacher. Can I say something about this preacher, Jonah? It was a backslidden preacher. I mean, he just got out of the whale's belly. When God told him to go preach, he goes the opposite direction. If that's not backslidden, you don't get any more backslidden than that. He's backslidden, and yet God still chooses to use a backslidden preacher. Now, can I say that is very important because in our day and age... If God uses a man in a meeting somewhere and meeting breaks out, uh, uh, it seems like everybody needs to now have that man. He's got the secret to revival. Can I say God don't need a man to bring revival? He's using a backsliding preacher right, right, right here. Uh, revival's not in the man. I love the men that are coming, but I got news for you. Let me help you right now. They don't have revival in their briefcase. It's not about them. And you need to get a hold of that right now. If you hadn't learned that by now, you're, you're in trouble. He's not only a backsliding preacher, he's a brass preacher. He goes down there and says, Nineveh, you've got 40 days, and God's going to overthrow you. He didn't preach with love. He didn't preach with compassion. He didn't preach with sympathy or empathy. He wasn't trying to help them. He was boasting, and he was looking forward to the day that Nineveh was wiped out. He hated them people. You don't believe it? Read chapter 4. Hmm? He's a backslidden preacher, he's a brass preacher, and he's a bitter preacher. Matter of fact, he gets mad at God because God uh, uh, doesn't destroy him. And he tells God, he said, I didn't want to come down here because I knew that God, you were so good, you would help them people. So we see there's a preacher, 
that we wouldn't book to come preach in our church who preach and this great revival takes place. We see the place. We see the preacher. Now notice the plea. Can I say it was direct? He says, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Brother, that's kind of message. About twelve words to pray and go to the house. Huh? Very direct. You didn't have seven points, didn't have any sub points, wasn't no poem. Just direct. But can I say this? It was very deliberate. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh. He called them by name. But it was very damning. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Doesn't say might be, shall be. It was very damning. It didn't give him any hope didn't say repent or perish he said you're perishing Mm -mm. now let me help you with something today's revival campaigns are based more fleshly more emotionally more self gratifying then really want to do business with God. We feel like we got to be entertained. We feel like we got to have certain preachers in. We feel like we got to invite the churches in the area in and have all these things in order for God to move. Hogwash. Now, it's been over 100 years since true revivals come to America, but can I say one of the gra- less greatest revivals that happened that started in Wales, started with some young teenage girls having a burden for God to move. God used Evan Roberts in a great way to change Wales that fled throughout England and ended up coming to America because a few had a burden. If nothing else, this text ought to show us you don't have to be in a certain place because if God was going to revive America, wouldn't you think a revival come to D.C.? or New York City, or heaven help the Bible Belt, Asheville, North Carolina. I got good news for you. God can move anywhere, anytime. And God cares just about as much about Florence as anywhere. You don't need to have a well-known preacher who everybody knows his name. This guy wasn't even fit to preach, but yet God used him. You don't even have to have a great message. That message wasn't real good. But can I say that today we place too much emphasis on the preacher. I'm telling you, down south, I won't call some of their names because it'll shed some light on them. And, and But I'm telling you, down south a few years ago, God used a man. Revival went about six weeks in a church. A bunch of people got saved then everybody down south had to have that preacher. Guess what? No other meetings happened like that. Hmm? A few years ago in Burlington, North Carolina, a meeting broke out, and everybody had to have that preacher. Can I say, how many times did God part the Red Sea for Israel? How many times did three Hebrews come out of the fiery furnace? And I say, God doesn't do things exactly the same all the time. But yet, the last 30 years, preachers have given you what it takes to have revival, and they all say the same thing, yet revival hasn't happened. Too much emphasis on preachers. Too much expectation on production. You can't have revival unless a bunch of people get saved. Well, revival's not for the sinner. Revival's for the church. Keep that in mind. It's not about converts. It's about Christians getting close to God and getting right with God. But I will say this. If revival breaks out, you'll see people get saved. 
Can I say? Unfortunately, we base everything today on fruit. Nowhere in the Bible does, the, does God command us to bring, you know, produce fruit. We can't. He just tells us plant seed. He's the one that brings forth fruit. Paul said, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. But we, uh, we have categorized revival that certain things have to happen in order for revival to break out. And we place emphasis on the production. Can I help you something? Revival breaks out when the emphasis is on Jesus. All the rest of it is just ice cream on top of the cake. But I hear things about setting your sight on how many people you think will be saved or what God's going to do. And Show me anywhere in this text where from the king down to the animals they had any expectation God's going to do anything. They just knew they was all going to die. It's a dangerous thing. Uh, to set your sights on results. Now, last week, Brother Josh said something. Now, I know his intent. I'm not throwing him under the bus. I know his intent. His intent was we ought to have a, 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 a burden to see God do something. I understand that. But in Proverbs 29, 18, where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, that has nothing to do with revival. That has to do with having a vision for the will of God for your life. Now here's the danger about putting the emphasis on results or your expectation on production. Number one, you'll be disappointed if whatever you've envisioned doesn't come to fruition. Some of you will got this vision all of a sudden that your family's coming to church with you next week and if they don't come to church with you you're going to be all down in the dumps whether your family comes or your family doesn't come that has nothing to do with a revival if you got a burden brother Donald that God gives us all the way up to the vineyard property and he doesn't then you think God didn't hear your prayer. There's a danger in having an expectation of production because if it don't come to pass, and if you're not careful, you'll get bitter and you'll be like Jonah. Secondly, you limit God and His abilities. If I get a vision that God's going to give us up to the vineyard, I'm limiting God. What if God wants to give me all the forts? I caution you because of uh, Abraham. When Lot is down there in Sodom and God tells Abraham he's going to destroy Sodom, Abraham begins pleading with God, says if there's a hundred righteous men, and he pleads and Abraham stops at ten, not God. Abraham expected God to, to stop at ten if he found ten righteous men because he believed in his heart Lot had won his family. But can I say, Brother Bob, if Abraham would have got all the way down to two, I believe God would have said, okay. You better be careful what you pray for to God. You know what we're supposed to pray for? God's will. I don't want to limit him. Why would I want the vineyard if he'd give me all of Florence? Or why pray for Florence when he give us all of Kentucky? Hmm. Why pray for Kentucky if he wants us to give us the whole country? You say, God's not able. You don't know my God. He's changed countries before. The third thing about your expectation of production is you permit yourself to take some credit for what God does. 
Well, I prayed God would give us this, and He did. So the emphasis is on I. I believe Paul said, not I, but Christ that liveth in me. So there's a danger when you start looking for results. I'm just looking for Him, friend. Whatever He chooses to do, it'll be good because He does all things well. Hmm? And can I say something else about today's campaigns? There's too much emphasis on the preacher, too much expectation of production. Hey, who are we that God would even meet with us? If he does, we're well ahead of the game. Are you listening? But then there's also too much exaggeration of a price. Every preacher I've heard preach on revival say, you got to pay a price. You ever heard that? Got to pay a price. Got to pay a price. Got to pay a price to get God's attention. Uh, Nineveh had God's attention long before Nineveh even knew God was a looking. If God didn't care about Nineveh, he'd have never sent a preacher down there with a plea. Mm. I've got news for you. Every one of us knows there's nothing we can do to get saved except believe and repent. You don't get baptized to get saved. You don't give money to get saved. Not of works, lest any man suppose. Well, if we can't work to be saved, what makes you think we can work to get God to move to bring revival? Too much emphasis on this stuff. So with all that in mind, I'm going to give you just what this text says on how to have true biblical revival. Do you want revival? Do you want to see God move in your heart and your life and change things around you? Well, you need to know how to have it, don't you? Hmm? So how are we going to have true biblical revival? We need true biblical revival. Hmm? I remember last summer when God blew through here, you saw young people on the altar. We're not seeing as many young people on the altar now. Hmm? Huh? I guess staying home from school and spending time with mom and dad's caused them to get backslidden. Some of you will get what I just said. Hmm. Uh, when they had their eyes on mom and dad, they saw the Lord. Anyway, does Used to, folks had a zeal to come to church. I'm seeing some drag in. Devils beat up on them, they're dragging in. We need revival. The Bible's putting things back in their proper focus. So how can we have true biblical revival? Well, the people of Nineveh, first of all, heard. Listen to verse 3. So Jonah rose, went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, if this is a great city, that means it's got a lot of people. He walked his day's journey into the middle of this place and cried out that simple sermon, yet they heard it. Now, I dare say, go to any intersection in Florence, stand out in the middle of the street and holler, Jesus is coming soon. See how many people hear you. But they heard him. Could it be maybe his appearance? I mean, he's got whale puke all over him. Go back, read chapter 2. The whale vomits him up on the, on the shore. God says, go to Nineveh. He goes, nowhere do I see does he stop and get cleaned up. He doesn't look like other people look. And he says, Hey, Nineveh, yet forty days, thou shalt be overthrown. There's something about him. Maybe it was the boldness of speech he had. He didn't sound like other preachers they'd heard. He didn't come and say, Every day's a Friday. He's bold, he smells, he looks a mess. 
But there's something about him because they heard what he said. Mm -mm. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace uh, and bring glad tidings of good things. Uh, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, uh, who hath believed our report? Uh, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, without faith it's impossible to please God. So if we're going to have revival... We don't need to hear what Daniel Waters and Cody Zorn have to say. We need to hear what God has to say. You've got to hear what he says. Now, here's the problem. We've heard preaching so much that we don't hear it. Hmm? How many of you get tired of hollering your kid's name and never getting their attention? Crystal raised her hand. Xander, Xander, Xander. What's his middle name? Xander Stephen. Then he pays attention. Huh? Quit biting your head. We all know it's true. Huh? I can just hear Miss Dawn. Nadley, Nadley, Nadley. Peter, do something with her. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. Hey, I pay attention. We're just like that. The Lord's speaking all the time. He's speaking to us all the time. But we're not listening. We hear His voice, but we don't hear what He's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord don't speak with an audible voice, but He speaks. Speaks through the Spirit of God. Speaks through the Word of God. Speaks through the man of God preaching the Word of God. He is speaking, but we've got a real problem with listening. We've got too much noise in our life. Too many things that have grabbed our attention that we're not listening to God. Nineveh, a great city, a busy city, but they heard what God said. We won't have a revival next week if we don't hear what God says. Hmm? you got to hear what thus saith the Lord. They not only heard, but they held to, or they believed. Look at verse 5. Look what it says. So the people of Nineveh believed Jonah. Is that what it says? They believed God. They heard what God said, and then they believed God. Hmm? If we don't believe what God says, we're in trouble. Now listen, i got enough confidence in the men that are coming or any man that is appointed to preach next week that they know God. And they're not coming just because they don't have anything better to do. If there's anything that happened last year, it humbled a lot of evangelists. Because a lot of them didn't get to preach much last year because of COVID. Churches were closed everywhere. Mm -hmm. So when they get an opportunity to preach now, they make certain that they take full advantage of it. So they're going to come with something to say from God. Will we hear it, and then will we believe it? I want to tell you something. These men have spent time with God, and you already know, you've heard them preach. They're, they've got something to say. Are we going to believe it? Hmm? Many times, by the time we get to our car, we've done forgot what the preacher had to say. We don't meditate on it, think on it, chew on it, see what God was saying. I've got news for you. In every message, God is something for you. If they get up and they preach on salvation one night, say, Preacher, I'm saved. If you come and you come wanting something from God and come seeking something from God, there'll be something in every message that'll help you. And then when you hear it, will you believe it? 
I believe God says what he means and means what he says. I don't know a whole lot, but I believe every word in this Bible. And I believe if God speaks and if God cares enough about us to speak to us, we better pay attention. They heard, they held to, they believed, and then they heeded. They did something with what they believed on. Jesus said this, When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? The Bible says in the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. The devil don't mind you coming to church. He don't want you to, but he don't mind you coming. He just don't want you to do, with, do anything with what you hear. He don't want you to allow what you hear to affect you and change you. We wouldn't need revival if we didn't need to change some things. So we must heed to what God says. What's God is saying? See, their belief motivated them to do something. What did they do? Well, first of all, they put into practice. They did something. They obeyed what they heard. They believed God was going to destroy them. So they had to put something into practice. Can I say something? Next week, God's going to say something you need to obey. Let me help you something, Brother Clint. God may have already spoke to you in the last few weeks. Don't expect anything next week if you haven't obeyed what He's already spoke to you about. Some of you sitting here right now know you need to move up and get closer to God. Why wait till Friday night and next week? Why don't you go ahead and get, get closer to God tonight and you'll be ready next week and you'll enjoy the week. Mm -mm. I learned this a long time ago, Brother John. God usually only speaks once. And we'll wrestle and we'll roll around and wall. But he usually only speaks once. When God called me to preach, Brother Bob, He just spoke to my heart once. Then I spent about a month wrestling, fighting, wallowing with God. He only spoke once. Hmm. Can I say this? God's already spoke to some of y'all's hearts. You already know you're not where you need to be. Can I help you with what the Bible says? Draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. He's done told you what you need to do. Just do it. See, that's what they, they heeded. They did something with what God said. Sitting back hoping things change is not going to change. If God has spoke to you, you need to change. They put into practice. Then they prayed and they fasted. And they prayed and fasted so much they made the animals fast. They said, don't even feed the animals, don't even give the animals. I mean, we're talking about in a desert. They said, don't feed the animals. Animals could have died. And they knew they was all going to die if they didn't get God's attention. Hmm? They prayed, they fasted, and then they pivoted, they repented. The Bible said down there about verse uh, 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 number 8, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn or pivot every one from his evil way uh, and from the violence that is in their hands. Uh, who can tell if God will turn uh, and repent and turn away from the fierce anger that we perish not? Brother James, wishing that things will get better won't make them better. If God has said something to you that you need to do, you need to turn from what you're doing to Him. That's the only way things going to work. If we don't turn from the direction we're going to His direction, how can we expect mercy? They not only prayed and fasted, they quit their evil ways. Otherwise, Miss Sin to God wouldn't help them. Now, Miss Mary, don't come down here next week shedding big crocodile tears on the altar and praying and boo-hooing and all that if you don't intend to turn and do what God says. God's not impressed with your big crocodile tears. God's impressed with what happens in your heart. Hmm. They heeded. They heard. They held to. Heard the message. They believed. And they turned from their ways to God's ways. And then something happened. 
Well, how do you know something happened? They wanted other people to turn. They heralded. The king and the nobles began to publish to everybody. Turn. Pray. Fast. Don't let your animals uh, uh, eat. Make them put on sackcloth. Make them stand in ashes. Uh, let's get serious about this thing. They started telling everybody. God's going to destroy us. We better get serious. And then can I say this? Their prayer was honored. Look at verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. But can I say, many of the wicked, they've never sat in a Bible-believing church. They've never cracked open a Bible to the book of Jonah. They've never sat under preaching. They've never been taught. But we have. If God's angry with them, how much angrier do you think God is with those that should know better and don't? I don't know about anywhere else, but I know about the preaching that's been done behind this pulpit. And I'm not looking at self, I'm looking at the caliber of men we brought in here. Hmm? But I will say this, I try my best to preach that book. And, and I'll say this, Emmanuel Baptist Church is without excuse to not desire a move of God. And if you've sat under this preaching any length of time, you're without excuse to stay in your sin or stay in your cold, complacent state or stay in your, you know, just lukewarm state. You ought to desire to see God do something. We've had some inklings. We've had some, some flurries of God moving through here. That ought to create a hunger for you to see more. I said all that to say this. Real revival transpires when our hearts unify with God's heart. That's when real revival transpires. When our heart lines up with His. Can I say, results will come as the evidence of true revival. Now, we have an account of an obscure place with a terrible preacher. But the mercy of God And this place gets right with God. Can I say, not just the king, everybody in Nineveh got right with God. Wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody in the church got right with God? Wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody in the county got right with God? Wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody in the state got right with God? You see, Brother Donald, I've read a lot about revival. I've read where revival broke out so good that the honky-tonks closed. I've read about revival where uh, pilgrims coming through, you know, wayfaring stranger coming through, passing through a town, and just a heaviness hit them when they got to the outskirts of town. Were drawn to the church house where everybody was. Walked through the door and fell on their face and called on God to save them without even knowing what in the world was going on. I've read where the power of God being so strong in places like that. But Miss Christine, I've never seen it. But I've read about it. I sure would like to see it, Brother Bob. Hmm? I sure would like to see God just hover in where everybody's got to take notice of God. I believe as Vance Havner said, said all you got to do is get on fire for God. People will come out and watch it burn. 
But you can't get on fire for God till you get honest with God. Instead of praying for revival, why don't you pray that God just revives you? We're real good at looking around who we think needs revival. I can tell you right now who needs it. The one you look at it in the mirror every day. So why don't we just go ahead and try and get God's attention by just being obedient tonight and say, Lord, you've already spoke to my heart in the weeks gone by of things you're not pleased with in my life. And God, I'm not where I used to be, but I sure would like to get back there. And why don't we just do business with God tonight? Hmm? Tonight would be a good night. Does everybody know what tonight is? It's not a trick question. It's Wednesday, is it not? Day for your birthday. You've had it circled on the calendar for a long time. You know what the significance of tonight is? What is Sunday? Easter. Jew Jewish Passover. Now the world of Christian Christianity, in quotation marks, says Friday is a holy day. Good Friday. Well, that's a lie. There's nothing good, by the way, other than God. And they say that because they say Jesus died on Friday. Nope. You can't be in the grave three days and three nights dying on Friday. And you got to understand, back in Bible days, they didn't have 24-hour days. They had sun up and sun down. In order for Jesus to be in the grave three days and three nights, he died on Wednesday. What better day to get right with God on the day that he, that he represents the day he died on? By the way, he's never going to die anymore. So why don't we just die out to sin? Hmm? Be a good day. Then you can come out on Resurrection Sunday and rejoice. Huh? So I wonder tonight, are you willing to tell God you need revival? You will and tell God, God, I'm the one. My heart's not where it once was. Are you willing to pray this? Maybe you don't know where you are with God. Why don't you pray what one of the writers said in the Scriptures? God, try me to see if there be any wicked way in me. Hmm? Hmm? I promise you, if we all start praying like that, it won't matter who comes next week and who preaches. We'll be ready. My fear is we got too much confidence in Cody Zorn or Daniel Waters or too much confidence in something else. We're not looking in the right places. I, my problem is we're thinking, well, we want to see this happen and that happen. You know what I want to see? I want to see Jesus. Sirs, we would see Jesus. I just want to see him high and lifted up. I just want to hear his voice. I just want to hear songs that glorify him. I, just, I want it all to be about him. Then everything else will be all right. It don't matter. But I wonder, are you willing to come tonight and say, Father, let it start in me. Because there's only one person in this building you have any control over, and that's you. So why don't you do business with God and keep doing business with God? They just didn't pray one time. They stayed in prayer till God heard and answered prayer. Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to really seek God these days? Because, friend, I don't know if you've noticed, things aren't getting any better in this world. Matter of fact, if Jesus don't intervene in America, the America that you and I have once known, it doesn't even resemble. We've got a mashed potato head in the, in the Oval Office writing executive orders that absolutely violate the Constitution. I don't know what the Supreme Court's doing, but I'm here to tell you America's gone unless God intervenes. There's coming a day, they're going to tell you, this book right here is a hate book. You can't preach out of it anymore because it uses pronouns like he and she. Hmm? Uh, there's coming a day where they're going to say, no, you can't go to Emmanuel Baptist Church because you all are not all-inclusive. Oh, yeah, we are. Jesus died for all. 
All can come. Whosoever will may. Huh? Matter of fact, I put on the side, you don't even need reservations to come here. Right. Up the street you do, but not here. Everybody's invited. Come on. Huh? You just can't take part until you've done business with Jesus. And we do it by His standards, not Washington's. Hmm? I'm telling you. You won't miss the water till the well runs dry, so we better get in the well this week. Are you listening? And maybe it needs to start tonight. Let's all stand, Brother Clint. You come. Have you heard God's voice? Has He spoke to your heart tonight or in days gone by? Need to do business? You concerned enough about yourself, your children, your grandchildren, do business with God? You willing to say, Lord, it's me, it's me. Lord, have mercy. Folks are coming, they're praying. Clint's getting a song picked out. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, in that text, we've seen a terrible place. We've seen a not-so-good preacher. But we see the mercy of God. So God, help us to believe, heed, Lord, be obedient. Put into practice and pray. Do what God says. And then God have mercy. Lord, I know I need revival. God, revive me. Lord, I'm looking for you. I long to see you, but Lord, I need you. I pray you do great things around here in the days to come, but may it start tonight. God, give us a hunger for you and your righteousness. Lord, we see the shape of the world. Lord, lost people see the shape of the world. God, help us to cast our affections and our eyes upon you. God, just move around here a little bit tonight. Help folks do business with God. Lord, speak to hearts. Help folks to turn from their ways to your ways. And God, just get glory. And God, whatever you choose to do, we'll be pleased with it. We just want to see you, Lord. Have your way now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.